Okay, so we might move now on to uh, questions and um, we have Leanne Weibel, who many of you may have met during the, uh, the regional consultation. So of the 14, I did six, facilitated six, Leanne facilitated six and another colleague of ours did two. So, um, so Leanne is just getting things organised now in terms of the questions. Here we yeah. go. So Leanne, can you just double check and just go back up to the uh, top of the page, just double checking that we've got the first one there. Here we go. Excellent. Um, so the first question, and I know a few people um, aren't on, uh, online, they're just, they've just dialed in, so I'll just read these questions out. So the first question is, uh, if you're an innovation, if you are an innovation ecosystem within one of the 12 regions and don't want to be a lead applicant but want to work into the lead applicant, how do we register this interest? Well, I think that sort of is covered off a little bit with what Paul was just saying then. I'll just quickly yeah. say that you should have a discussion with the State Development yeah. Director in your region who will have a view about how the market is shaping up there. Yeah. Um, Ideally, it would be good if you were on the page at this stage as one of the partner organisations, but um, you will not be precluded from that in, in the stage door full application process. But I would say have a conversation with the local state development office in the first instance to see if you can get clarity about who might be lead proponent or lead proponents in the area. No, that's great. Jackie, have you got anything else on that? Or? No, no I, but, yeah, you yeah. can come on board at any time, but it's great to get your interest registered now. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Okay, yeah. that's great. Okay, so moving on to the second question then, is is there any possibility of an extension for pre-registration? Uh, we have a very large area with a lot of people to consult with. I think I'm moving around. <laughs> um, uh, and the time frame given it is very tight for us to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and look, that's a, that's a fair point. I oh, know, Paul, do you want to just touch on um, that again? It's yeah, well, um, I, must, I must say that at this stage there is a deadline of close of business, Friday the 18th of November. Um, if, if a region has a particular problem, they should perhaps um, communicate, to that, communicate that to us. Quickly. Quickly, yes, yep. as soon as. Yep. But at this stage, yeah. the 18th of, the the 18th of thing, November is a hard yeah. deadline. The other thing that I would say is that when we went out into the regions, people talked about, and you, you said it a bit, that there um, there is a range of activities happening in each region. Mm. And this is about, you know, at least starting with the coalition of the willing. Who's there already? Who's doing the hard yards? And who's already working together? So what I would say is, um, you know who those people are in your region, if you're already active. Yep. You know who those um, those people are that are already, you know, they, they're already active, they're already involved. Work with them first. If you can get your five partners and you can put your pre-registration in, you've got to the first hurdle. And then we can start expanding out. Then we can start looking at what your outreach locations are. We can look at the, the different activities. Mm -hmm. So look for the coalition of the willing in your region first um, and make sure that you've got your uh, your pre-registration in. Yep. No, that's it. Um, so there was a question about the twenty thousand. Question about the twenty thousand. Um, the answer is it doesn't have to be matched. Yep. It's no. it's funding that we will make available to a maximum of twenty thousand per region if it's needed to develop their approach to the collaborative action plan. It, it so it doesn't be, need to be matched. It comes out of the five hundred, but it doesn't need to be matched. Yep. Uh, the next one there is, can you please reiterate how you will resolve multiple strong pre-registrations in a single region? Um, yeah, so this, I'll, I'll start with this one, but you know, essentially if we get um, two or three or four pre-registrations that are very strong from a single region, the process is going to be to go back to those groups and let them know initially, and again this is part of the reason for the pre-registration, to let them know that we've got these groups, these four groups that are put in and to start that discussion. Um, we are looking at actually running workshops mm -hmm. to see with those groups to see whether we can bring 
those groups together into a single application. Um, you know, if that's not possible, well then the department will be sort of looking at that, but that's the intent. No we, we, have, we have said that we will fund no more than two proposals per region. Um, that's a, that's a, a definitive position with respect to this program. So the idea will be that um, after close on the 18th of November, Brian is right, we will look at the extent of, um, of uh, the number of pre-registrations and we will communicate with each of those parties with regard to trying to get them together to facilitate it, uh, what are the common linkages and opportunities where they possibly could get together. But four proposals or three proposals from a region will not be funded under this program, maximum of two. It makes the, the funding pool too small to actually get the impact that's required but and that means it's a competitive process which is why we have an assessment panel. But um, And that's partly why we set the bar the way that we did that it has to have be collaborative partners yep. because that's what people said that they wanted and that it has to have match funding. So some of those groups will naturally come together quite nicely because some of them will provide part of the puzzle that the other part can't. So um, we'll be looking for opportunities of interest, not forcing people together. So um, you know, I think people shouldn't be concerned or um, they're worried about that process but it is about you know helping people come together and making the most sense and the most benefit out of this program for each region. Yeah. Just quickly, the other reason we went down this pre-registration path was to try to reduce the workload and the burden of uh, different groups putting in major applications, and then essentially, you know, we'd be sort of looking at multiple applications trying to pick winners, mm -hmm. and that was another strong theme that came out of the regional consultations that. We didn't want that to occur, so that's the other reason. If there's no problem with multiple groups putting in, this part of this pre-registration is to make sure that we give everyone an opportunity to be heard. But then we're going back to try to to see whether we can bring that single application together. And I must say also that once a um, green light is given to a consortium to put their staged or full application together, we will publish that on the website. Yes. Yeah so that people know within a region who is developing this approach and who they can approach and talk to about yep. their interests. Yep. Mm -hmm. no. So the next question there is uh, what are the plans for the regional network fund uh, and, the, and the criteria for participation? Um, Jackie, yeah. do you want to pick up on that one? Um, the network fund at this stage isn't going to open like a fund where you apply for, like people apply for the funding under it. What happens is that as we get these um, regional innovation programs up and running in each of the regions. This fund will support activities that connect those regions, that provide services across multiple regions, and we'll be consulting with the groups in each of those regions to talk about what sorts of things they need and when they need them. Mm -hmm. It might be things like um, visiting entrepreneurs and that, that we can help fund uh, a particular expert to go to multiple areas and to do um, discussions or workshops or presentations, things like that. It could be about um, delegations coming to the annual summit yep. and doing a showcase. Um, it could be, you know, there's a range of different things. It could be a platform of communication among the, the um, regional innovation centres and things like that across the state. So that's something that we will engage and consult directly with the groups as they get off the ground how this um, fund can support their activities to expand their, their interest you know, into other areas and connections into other regions across the state. Yep. No, that's great. Okay, uh, Leanne, can you just move to the next question, please? Just waiting for that one to come through. Thank you. Oh, a long question. <laughs> You guys are just trying to test me here. So part of this process for regions is to engage with key stakeholders to have them invest, uh, in brackets, financially into the sustainability of the ecosystem models to save every region creating their own messaging. Uh, is there scope for state to create uh, targeted messaging for key corporations, etc., as to why they should get involved in supporting their ecosystems? Mm. Yep. I'm happy to answer this. Yep. So, um, just picking up on the last point about the um, about the fund, um, that is really an area of potential opportunity for uh, the network fund 
um, to, to develop uh, communications, profiles, highlighting the relative strengths and opportunities there are in the regions and being able to promote that information or disseminate that information to both uh, Queensland national and international corporations who the government um, and other uh, large corporations looking to enter the state are, um, are seeking that information. Um, we work very closely with Trade and Invest Queensland and we work very closely with the business um, investment uh, function in the State Development Department as well. So I can see that is a very good question. Um, it's the sort of uh, opportunity that we need to be identified from the point of view of using the network fund um, into the future. Yeah, and also, yeah, the profiling that we can do from um, engaging with all of the the regions about what's mm -hmm. happening in their region and and yeah. pulling up some of the case studies, success stories, things like that. Yeah, yeah. No, that's great. Uh, next question is: uh, Would a chamber of commerce which represents more than five businesses be acceptable? Um, I might start this one. Um, the the answer is yes. Um, the the key thing there though is that uh, it probably needs to engage more than five just businesses. It needs to actually broaden out the uh, the stakeholder base. But before I hand over to uh, to Paul or Jackie, I think the key thing there is not to get hung up on the number five. Five is the minimum. Um, and we set that mainly to try so that uh, lead proponents that um, submitted could demonstrate that they had uh, enough interested parties across a number of the uh, different types of organisations of an ecosystem uh, to justify them being a lead. I oh, know, Paul, did you? Oh, just briefly, um, again, Brian, um, we we would be looking for a representative cross section of the innovation and business sector in a region to be part of the collaboration effort, right? So we wouldn't want to see all of the the lead applicant and all of their partners being all the same type of organisation. It, it's really important that we have uh, evidence that there is uh, diversity and that there is um, uh, that the, the, the sort of the broader elements of the ecosystem are being um, addressed in in the partnership itself, which could be, as I mentioned, from the university uh, sector, small business community, industry. You know, even down into the school education side, from the point of view of young entrepreneurs. So, not a, a proposal coming forward nominating five businesses um, would be very unusual, in my in my um, understanding. Yeah. Yeah, and it'd all be about what each of those partners contribute. Mm. This is an innovation yeah. fund, so um, you know there needs to be a range of different parties, as Paul said, Paul and Brian have said contributing different parts of the puzzle to, to make the ecosystem hum. Yep. So yes, yeah. so, and, and what they each contribute, it might be funding, it might be expertise, it might be a range of different things, mm. but they all need to contribute something. Yep. No, that's great. Um, next question is, there has been a very short time frame to collaborate for pre-registration. Oh. Is there flexibility yes. to change the scope of the project as parties become? Yes, yes. Yeah, Ab so. absolutely. Yeah, I think, um, I think that, yeah. the pre-registration, yeah. just getting yep. Getting getting your uh, your uh, your At collaborative group together and getting on uh, getting on the track is important. You can then modify your approach um, over the coming weeks or months. Yeah, and, and again, just reiterating why we did the pre-registration process. It was to allow that to occur, so that people could actually come forward and say they're interested, so that that follow-on discussion can actually occur before the full applications are put in. Yeah. Uh, next question is, uh, if I heard correctly, Paul said that the evaluation criteria for this program includes collaboration, 40%, mm -hmm. and value for money, 20%. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the other evaluation criteria? Yeah. Uh, leverage, sustainability, and impact. Okay. Yeah. So the four technical evaluation criteria are collaboration at 40%, impact at 20%, capability, developing capability at 20%, and a very broad value for money criterion at 20%. So 
So the sub-elements of each of those four assessment criteria are outlined on pages four and five of the guidelines for you to give more in-depth consideration to. Um, I suppose you know impact is is important. So why have we picked collaboration and given it a 40% weighting? That is that is designed to send a specific signal to the market that that is the most important fundamental objective and criteria that we are trying to um, foster with this program. Hence my comments before and Jackie's and Brian's comments that we're looking for a broad partnership to deliver this over the, the uh, over the three year period. Um, not all the same type of organisations, but organisations in different parts of the innovation system, from early stage to maturity stage, etc. So that's that's the collaboration, and not only inside the region, it can be some partners from outside the region. So that's um, will be given um, equal consideration. So don't you don't have to just confine your search for partners from within the region, and obviously impact. Is, is really about um, measurable benefits over the period of the project and beyond that are there for um, the long term. You know, they're not only obviously from a government point of view about business creation and support and job creation, but it's also about you know strengthening the local economy and linking the economy to other um, important parts of the Queensland and national economy, and international for that matter as well. Um, so impact is uh, is important, and obviously capability. And I think Jackie alluded to this. So that is around um, issues to increase knowledge, increase skills, um, to make sure that they are um, uh, retained as much as possible by the businesses and startups and players that receive access to those services, that there's very much that community building aspect to the project proposal and that it is building on the diversity of uh, projects that have gone before and taking them to another another level. And so value for money is around reach, you know, the, the number of firms and, and locations within the region that are touched by your proposal. They're about regional industry engagement, about social, so economic and social impact. So I know there are in some regions there are a number of social enterprises that are looking to be part of the equation there. They may not be that well connected with some of the entrepreneurial and business players at the moment, but I do know that there are community groups and social enterprises that are interested in becoming connected. Um, and then the, the services delivered and how widely they're delivered and that we set up communities of practice for uh, to to last beyond the delivery of the program itself. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the issue is also about the financial leverage. So, you know, that one to one ratio um, is important um, uh, in terms of the financial contributions and in kind contributions. But all those factors will be weighed up by the assessment panel in deciding whether to endorse the proposal or request that the department go back to the proponent and seek a bit more additional information so that they can make a final decision. Yep. Thanks. No, that's great. Thanks for that. Jack, did you have anything else to add? No, I think that was, no, that was good. Good. Okay, that's great. Let's wait for the next question to come up. We can always make one up. Oh, no, here we go. So the next one is, is there any flexibility regarding government versus non-government funding sources to make up the matched one-for-one -one funding? Uh, we have multiple government sources, uh, all three governments, but not many large businesses. Uh, Jackie, do you want to take um, lead on this one? I mean, I'll talk? just quickly say some things that um, it is about being over the life of the, the project, so it could be over yep. three years. Um, and so you, you could use the program to kind of build those relationships and get um, and bring that funding in. It could also be about um, revenue sources that you can raise from activities that you conduct as part of the program. So um, at this stage, like yeah, we uh, we need to make sure that the the programs are funding and accelerating activities that the community wants and that will have sustainability and impact. Yep. So. 
that's that's really what the, the um, match funding criteria is all about, yeah. trying to make sure that you do get that collaboration, you do embed those activities across the community and it does have a sustainability across past the, the funding commitment. Yeah. So, Paul, yeah. did you want to add? Oh, just that uh, I would say that when I outline the three mixes that 25% is in kind. So if you added the 25% Get from other government with the 25% in kind, that takes you up to 50% contribution from government. So you theoretically could have a 50% contribution in cash from the private sector or from organisations that represent the private sector, and you could have a 50% cash and in kind contribution from the other two levels of government. Yeah. But that would be the maximum combination yeah. uh, under the guidelines. And look, I'll just make a, a comment here, and again, look, from a, a, a private sector perspective, and when we were looking at, again, the, the structure of all of this and the feedback we were getting from the regional consultations, the, the concern was that um, these would become, if you like, uh, government-driven, hmm. and that rather than having an ecosystem which had balance with private sector involvement and, and driving that as well. And so there was a lot of discussion around this whole waiting piece, um, and and that's the reason we sort of came up with this mix, was um, because if we're going to get sustainability, we actually need uh, private sector groups to be sort of stepping up with all of this, um, because they're the ones that, uh, yeah, again, a successful ecosystem means that we've got successful business, mm -hmm. businesses. Um, and so that's why it's really important to have their contribution as part of this. And that really goes to the heart of the impact evaluation criteria too. Yeah. That's that's the evidence is the impact of the activities that have uh, built, have developed and strengthened the innovation system in the region and that the support has increasingly come from private sector participation in the delivery model. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the next question is, uh, could you expand upon the mix in emphasis on working with startups, SMEs and larger companies? Uh, in the past, there has often been a strong emphasis just on startups. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll start okay. with this one because, um, and this was something that we really emphasised during the regional consultations that to build uh, an innovation ecosystem, it's not just about startups. Uh, and this picks up on Paul's earlier point. Startups are very important, but it's equally important that SMEs and larger corporates also become part of this. And I'd include in there not-for-profits as well, mm -hmm. and government. So it, you know, it's actually having activities and events and interactions, if you like, between a whole range of different organisations to build this ecosystem because everyone brings different strengths to it all. So. Um, and yeah, yeah. one thing that I'd add, like yeah. a couple of the um, workshops that I was at, there was a lot of discussion because there's great diversity in the room, which was fabulous. But there was a lot of discussion about um, building some bridges between yeah. the startup community mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the broader business or industry community, and that they wanted, you know, this to, to be able to help with that. So um, I think, you know, in Toowoomba, Gladstone, and, and a few other places, we heard that a lot that you know they could actually um, benefit from each other and, and building some stronger links. Yeah. W would be a really beneficial thing for that ecosystem. And you've also got to see this program in combination with other programs under Advanced Queensland. So, you know, we have the Startup Events Fund and we also have the Young Starters Fund, you know, um, and a number of other programs. So they're meant to be complementary, not singular, separate programs. So you've got to look at the whole... Um, oh, the federal government yeah, incubator. Well, yep, exactly. Well, yep. so. So, um, so with the incubator support initiative, which is open um, continuously, and I know a number of regions are um, at an advanced stage with putting a proposal together, we we have said in the guidelines that you know of our contribution, 10% that could meet the 10% contribution mm -hmm. for uh, a proponent for a proposal for the incubator support initiative, um, but we also emphasise that if you are if there is a proponent in a region looking to put a proposal forward to the Aussie industry program, they should they should uh, consider putting a, a, a re advancing regional innovation proposal to us in the first instance. So we I, I should emphasise 
that we have uh, have been having um, very uh, positive discussions with Oz Industry about how these programs complement one another uh, and are available to the marketplace at the same time. So, you know, once again on this one, Brian and Jackie, I would mm -hmm. say that because you've got a three-year trajectory, your focus of your activities could could slightly change and move over the three years. You know, it could be a startup, heavy startup emphasis in one year, lessening towards more building bridges with SMEs and industry in the second and third year. It's that's the great thing about this program: the flexibility to choose activities and programs that are fit for the um, the stage at which the region's at, basically. Yeah. No, that's great. Uh, so next question there's uh, in a $1 million application, mm -hmm. uh, that is where an applicant is seeking a co-contribution from the state of $500,000, what is the limit for co-contributions from other government sources, federal or local? Mm -hmm. um, I'll cover that before. So cash, 250000 Yep. 25% of um, the dollar contribution. Yep. Um, so, and then a similar, it could be as high as the 25% yep. in kind. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I think that answered the next question as well. Someone's very diligently worked out some calculations for us. We don't have a calculator to double check it. Um, information, so this is looking at the information flyer when calculating the 25% cash cap from the government sources. Is it 25% of the 75% and Leanne just shifted our question uh. out? We'll come back to that hopefully in a moment. So, can, um, well, shall we just, Here yeah, we go. Okay. It's a very complicated question. Um, unless you can quickly answer that one, Paul, it's. So the maximum cash contribution would be 125,000. I've just got some helpers in the room with me. Can, can we um, can we move on and we might come back to we, that one? Yeah, we'll be mm -hmm. um, trying to put some responses up for these some ones quick as well. calculations. We just need mm -hmm. to calculate that one out. That's a good question. Yeah. So um, we'll move to the next question. Thanks, Leanne. Yeah, so it is right. That's correct. correct. That's correct. There you go. So, okay. 125, yes. It's correct. <laughs> okay, so can TAFE qualify for this funding? Yep. Yeah, so can TAFE qualify for this funding? Uh, we have 55 mm -hmm. plus locations mm -hmm. across Queensland. Um, answer is yes. Uh, at a region by regional level. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And coming on board as, yeah, on a regional application. Yeah. And, you know, maybe in the fullness of time with the network fund, there may be some opportunities as we design that. But at the moment, it would be have to be on a region to region. Um, basis. Yeah, and so that's probably a key point um, because I know that other groups were looking at putting in, if you like, a region, like a, a across Queensland application. Mm -hmm. This the pre-qualification is based on um, a region by region. So it's a, you know, if you are putting in multiple applications or you're part of different groups, you know, you've got different locations. It needs to, you need multiple applications. Mm -hmm. It's not just one across a whole range of regions. Uh, next question, is there a preference to have local council involved as lead over a business or industry leader? And I think the answer is no. No, no. and I, as I, um, I mentioned that some organisations are more are better equipped to do this and depending on who your partners are, you need to have that discussion internally about who would be best placed to do the lead applicant role as opposed to all the other roles that need to happen. Yeah, so. mm -hmm. no, that's great. Now, I'm. Um, just before we go on to the next question, I'm just uh, cognizant of time uh, that uh, we have hit the, the one hour point. Uh, we're happy to continue to answer questions. Most people are still online. And most people are still <laughs> online. Um, but my apologies uh, with the timing with that, but we'll just continue to answer questions. Um, but those that do need to leave, we, we understand. Uh, the next question was, if an NGO limited by guarantee was established to represent the region and other government sources, uh, move me again. <laughs> Sorry, Leanne, if you can just go back to that. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Uh, need that top part again. 
Yeah, it's talking about... Okay, yeah, so here we go. If an NGO limited by guarantee was established to represent the region and other government sources put funding into that entity, uh, the funding would essentially belong to that new entity, would that qualify as non-government funds? My response to that would be that it would qualify as yeah. non-government funds because it's in that entity. Yeah. And that's that comment about um, company limited by guarantee and I'm aware there are a number of those scenarios being played out as we speak. So that would qualify as non-government funds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but that would be separate if there were, if it was a grant going into something like that. That's, that, different. Yeah, that's, that's different. That's right. That's right. They're yep. using their budget. That's right. Yep. If they're using their operating budget. Yep. Um, next question, I have a particular focus around Indigenous innovation. Is there an expectation in terms of the assessment that applications address Indigenous participation? Um, Jackie, or? Uh, I think it's a region by region um, re issue that, um, you know, we certainly, we would like to see people collaborate around the issues that are important to your region. And where Indigenous participation is important, yep. absolutely, we that would be, um, you know, considered I would say favourably um, without using a, another word, but yeah, we want to see what's important to your region and how to, um, you know, how to best mould this program for you guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, next question is: Can one of my outreach locations be outside the region? Um, the this is, I think, this is the two outreach right. yeah. locations. Yeah. So the answer to the question is no. No. At the, under the guideline, they must mm -hmm. two of them, a minimum of two, must be in the region. Itself. And, and can I just clarify, part of the, the thinking behind this outreach approach was recognising that, again, there may be a major centre within a region, mm -hmm. uh, but one of the key bits of feedback was that, you know, if, if just because there's a centre makes it very difficult for other locations within the region to participate, and that's what, you know, part of the purpose for having these at least two uh, outreach centres as part of the program. Yeah. And it's about activating more areas within a region yeah. um, as innovation and so, there may be facilities. So there's nothing to stop, for instance, in the partnership for members of the, for a member or members of the partnership to be in other regions, hmm. like in a collaborative oh, between the regions, definitely. right? There's nothing to stop that. But for the purpose of the evaluation criteria, the two locations, and 20% of the activities and funding must be in these outreach locations. Yep. Within the region. Within the region. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, Leanne, just moving on to the next question. Uh, will the contract with the lead applicants uh, across the different regions be the same and are we able to view the contract that will be in place between the lead applicant and the government? I believe that's it's a being funding drafted. agreement yep. and currently being drafted. Do you want to answer yep. that? Yep. Um, I just have to make. I'm not so. I'm not aware whether we put the terms and conditions on the website yet. No, we are developing the terms and conditions. They're going to be reasonably standard terms and conditions as we would apply to most of our business funding agreements under Advanced Queensland. Um, but we would expect them to be up. Um, shortly after we start the process of engaging with lead applicants. The only thing that is up there, of course, apart from the pre-registration, is the actual long-form application um, document for people to see. Yeah, okay, that's great. Uh, next question is, uh, would you please tell me how I find a lead applicant in my region? In the uh, first instance, yeah. um, talk to the State Development Officer. Yeah. Um, yeah. You can send us, if you want to send us an email, to that um, regional, regional innovation. innovation email address, you can send us an email and we will look at it and yep. see whether we can connect you as well. But yep. Jackie's right. I mean, in the first instance, we would have a discussion with the state development office in the region. Yep. We've had um, we've had uh, a, a, a significant teleconference with state development uh, mm -hmm. across the state, so they're yep. familiar. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Uh, next one is, can I be a partner organisation in more than one region? Um, yes, we'll yeah. cover that. The answer mm -hmm. is yes. Uh -huh. uh, next question is, I'm a consultant and I want to get involved in the stage application as a facilitator. Uh, how do I get involved? Uh, well, that's really going to be um, down to the, uh, if you like, the lead applicant um, in terms of them wanting to engage with other consultants to help with that process. 
once again, I yeah. would say, Brian, if you want yeah. to drop us an email yeah. to that effect, just drop an email to that um, generic email address. Yeah, point so in that direction. We'll, we'll take note of it. Yep. Uh, I'm a council, but I don't want to be a lead applicant who should pre-register from my region. Um, it's look, a good question. It really comes back down to who else is interested from uh, from business uh, or from not-for-profits or, or other other organisations. Yep. Yep. It's got to be one of the five categories yep. listed on page two of the guidelines. Yep. So any one of those five types of organisation can be lead applicant in any combination. Yep. Yeah. That's great. And always love that last one there, end of questions. Okay. Um, look, that's been really, uh, there have been some great questions, so thank you very much for sending those through. Uh, we hope that this process uh, has been useful. Uh, if you do have any other further questions, um, please feed them through, um, through the, the email address. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and, but I hope that you know, through the presentation and then also answering a, a number of the, the questions today that you get a better feel as to, I suppose, the, uh, the process, uh, the thinking behind this particular program and the framework that we've developed uh, and uh, more importantly, how you can get involved and, uh, and how collectively we can all you know, be involved in this program to make it successful. Um, so in, in wrapping up, um, Jackie, Paul, any final I Thanks. just wanted to say thank you for your time and for yep. your interest in this program. Um, and yeah, we hope to see you come through on the pre-registration. Yep. Cool. Yeah, same, same here. Thanks everyone for taking an hour out to join with us this morning. And we're looking to receive some very exciting proposals over the next couple of months. So all the best. Thanks. That's great. Good. Thank you everyone and, uh, and have a great day.